You're now tuned in to the Desire to Trade podcast, a show where we bring you the best figures of the trading world and teach you how you can become a successful trader. This is your host, Etienne Kret. Hey, what's up, traders? It's in Kratia, founder of Desire to Trade. And welcome to episode 59 of the Desire to Trade podcast. The podcast this week is with a good friend of mine, which I met a couple of times in Montreal, Albert Maté. Now you're going to see that this trader has a good background. He started to do a lot of trading and he's been doing a lot of manual trading. Then at some point he realized that this was not really for him and that he had to find a way to get himself out of trading to be able to make money. And that sounds funny, but it's really what happened. So you're going to see this interview is packed with lessons. And we dive a lot into how to create a system that's going to replace yourself to trade. Now, this is great if you want to code something or if you just want to learn about it. And there's going to be a lot of lessons about trading in general. So I'll leave you with the interview with Albert Maté. I'll come back at the end with the takeaways. All right, so today I'm with Albert Maté. And Albert has a really interesting story to tell today. He basically has been working in trading for a long, long time. But now he's working with something really cool. And I talked with him a couple of times in Montreal here at the meetup and a different place. And I'm really excited to have you here today, Albert. How are you doing? Very good. Thank you, Etienne. How are you doing? Cool. Very good. Thank you, as always. So I want to ask you, what is one quote that inspires you? A quote that inspires me, I would say, I had a quote on, on one of my posters when I was a young child in my room that said, in life, be happy, but always be yourself. It was written in Spanish. My parents are Spanish, but it basically translates in life. Try to be happy, but above all, be yourself. So I would say that's the quote that uh, comes to mind. I love it. And so tell us what's going on these days in your life, exactly. Uh, well, these days, pretty busy. As, as you mentioned, uh, I'm working on something new. A year and a half ago, I started a fintech startup called uh, Albi Trading. It's an algorithmic trading company, turnkey solution for uh, portfolio managers to help them beat the S&P 500? Well, that's a short answer. The long answer, there's a lot of things involved, but the short answer, yes. I'm 100% working on uh, Albi trading, and that's yeah. what keeps me busy these days. That's pretty cool. Isn't that a tough goal to beat the S&P 500, or is it pretty easy? Well, it is a tough thing to do. According to statistics, 85% of portfolio managers are unable to beat the S&P 500 consistently. And therefore, that's my goal. I'm proud to say that my results are conclusive. I've beaten the S&P 500 in the last five and a half years. These are back-tested results. And so, yes, it, it's very hard. But when you're focused, you have a dream, and you believe in something, and you're passionate, I think you can achieve pretty much anything. Hmm, cool. So at this point, you're involved in uh, algorithm trading, right? But that's not the way you started. So tell us exactly how you started to trade. Okay. I started, I'm going to show my age a little bit here and there, but I started in 98. Uh, I started uh, trading, uh, scalping fractions. This was before the stock market was in, went to decimalization. So uh, I started uh, scalping teens or one sixteenth of a dollar. And the objective back then was pretty simple. You try to scalp a sixteenth or a sixteenth is a six and a quarter pennies. And you try to do that a hundred times a day on a thousand shares. So that would probably give you about 625 US. So that's how I started, yeah, scalping uh, teenies. Were you working at that time for uh, a bank or an institution or for yourself? No, this was for myself. For those that don't know, I had a um, successful software business, which I uh, sold a year and a half ago to focus on Albi trading. And back then I also, no, I had started the seven years prior and so I had some disposable income and I wanted to try it out. And so I was trading for myself, but I was trading at a Montreal firm called Swift Trade at the time. I don't know if they're still around, maybe. But yeah, I had my own little uh, note desk and my three computer screens. And yes, I was doing it for myself. Hmm. And how was your learning curve as a trader? Did you have trouble to learn? Actually, back, I don't know if you remember, you're a young, young fella. You're probably in diapers. <laughs> <laughs> At the beginning, it wasn't hard. 
and this was in 98. So this was just as the dot-com bubble was growing. And you can just they'll pick anything and it would just double, triple, and it was easy money. So maybe that was, in a way, it, it didn't help me. So the learning curve at the beginning was easy, was pretty flat. But when the bubble busted in around 2001, around there, then it became much tougher. And that's where, I, I guess, as a trader, you started, everyone goes to a little period of um, reflection, to say the least. And that's where uh, you start the, you know, separating the men from the boys, so to speak, or girls from the women, whatever. No, that's, uh, mm-hmm. And so at the beginning, it wasn't hard, but later, later on, the, when you start losing money, that's when you decide if you want to continue trading or not. And how did you go from there? Because then you have to decide where you want to keep going, right? So I guess you kept going, which is good. But how did yeah. you keep going exactly? I took a pause, actually. That, that's how I kept going. I didn't want to. I had the, a good run, which most traders at one point have a good run. And then obviously when the bubble busted, start losing money. Let's, let's be honest here. No, you make money, then you start losing money. And I didn't want to lose everything that I had made. So I decided to take a pause, step away, let the emotions get back into check and whatever. And that's what I did. I took a pause. And then later, uh, a couple of years later, went back and started trading again. And did you have to go through any course or any, like, how did you keep going after? Well, I always remained passionate about the stock market, but I knew I had to take a different approach. So I, I did take some courses. I read some books. And when I felt motivated, well, I was always motivated, but when I felt ready or emotionally, so to speak, in a better place for trading, that's when I, uh, I started trading again. And you mentioned a good point, which is the fact that you have to be emotionally ready to trade. Yes, so. I totally agree with you. Uh, people might think, novice traders, I think there's a cycle, there's a process. You don't just wake up one day and say, I'm going to be a trader. Uh, there's a huge process involved. And, uh, but at the beginning, so I think we go through, at the beginning, we go through academically. We think, oh, okay, I have to l- learn the mechanics of a trade if I know how to to do the mechanics of a trade. If I read a couple, maybe a book or two, take a course or two, and then you know, apply what I learned academically, I'll be a trader. But that is only, in my opinion, uh, based on experience, just the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole process that goes through. There's a maturing. You have to mature as a trader in order to become successful. I have personally never heard of anyone who became a successful trader at the beginning. Now, making money does not make you successful, in my opinion. Success comes out of consistency because we've all made money at one point in time. The goal is to be consistently making money. I think that's the hard part. So I think it's, it's a process which evolves and uh, you have to know your feelings. You have to be in touch with the, what goes on between your brain, not between your ears and your head, to be able to recognize your emotional state and to have the discipline to be constantly listening to yourself, basically. And just to go back a little bit, how would you define someone who is emotionally ready to trade? That's a tough question. Someone who's ready to emotionally trade. I think you kind of develop, again, through experience, a sort of sixth sense. You kind of see, you kind of feel an emotional storm growing up inside of you. And the goal is to maybe to stop or to control your emotions ahead of the storm that is coming your way, so to speak. Sometimes I think that I share a common trait among seasoned traders or is that we get emotional. Most of our mistakes or our losses come from emotional mistakes. It has nothing to do with the mechanics of trading. You can learn how to trade in an afternoon. After that, it's all between the ears. It's all in your head. The the emotional fitness, so to speak, or, or control and And we don't have that when you start off. It's like a little little child, no? He starts to walk. Just because he's moving his legs forward doesn't always mean he knows how to walk. He can move forward, but he's not stable. Uh, And I think that emotional stability comes with time and actual doing trades. So you have to do, you got to put in the time. You got to put in the time as a trader and trade with real money in order to be emotionally prepared or stable, so to speak. Mm-hmm. I really love the, the picture of going through the storm. And I think it's something people have to go through. 
But would you say it's something you kind of acquire, so something you have right now, or is it, are you doing some things today to help you get stable emotionally? Well, to be honest with you, I don't have to do anything uh, right now because I have my algorithm that's screening for me. And <laughs> yeah. they say that necessity is the mother of all inventions. And in my case, it's 100% true. If I would have been successful from the start and consistently successful, I would have never thought or had the need to come up with the algorithm because I would have been successful. No, no. Why, why change something that is you're already good at? So the algorithm came out of my necessity to become consistent. And to be honest with you, I don't, as, as years accumulate, uh, though I'm still as passionate and, uh, about the stock market and everything, as you get older, you know, you have a little more, a little less patience. And instead of working, you know, 14 hours a day, you, you maybe work 10 no, hours. So you kind of slow down a bit. That's what I'm saying. And therefore, the algorithm was my way of, of, of saying, you know, this is how you be, can be consistent. Because looking back, and like I mentioned, most of the mistakes, if not all the mistakes I made, that caused my biggest losses were due to my emotions or my lack of discipline. So therefore, I knew I had to distance myself from the keyboard in order to be consistent. Because as you probably know, when we're intellectually, we all know what we need to do. But for some reason, when we're in front of the keyboard doing live trades, all that intellectual discipline or knowledge that we have just seems to go out the window and we just get you know, possessed so to speak, by our emotions. So I knew I had to distance myself from the keyboard. It was the only way I had to, I was going to be able to be consistent in my profits. So that's how I started. That's how this LB trading came, was born, out of necessity, more than desire. And how did you decide to go forward to build that system? Is it someone who introduced you to algorithm trading or is it you who decided to do that? Well, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a software developer by trade. No, I had uh, a certain skill set. I have a certain skill set when it comes to software. I can develop software. So therefore, in a way, I kind of put in, at the beginning, I put in my own time. I'm still putting in my own time. But it was just out of curiosity, the challenge. I would say, well, maybe I can write a bit of code and the strategy that I have, I can maybe put it into a little program and simulate it and see what results I get. So it started off as a little pet project, nothing too serious. And as I kept going, so, oh, okay, well, just go to step one. Oh, this looks interesting. I'm getting good results. Go to the next step, next step, next step. And this was four years ago. So two years ago, two and a half years ago, I was at a point where I was getting great results. Uh, I was talking to a couple of people and they were interested and and I just got my uh, juices flowing and I go, maybe I can turn this into a business. And so that's a year and a half ago. That's when I decided to, so to speak, go all in and sell my business and focus on this 110%. So it was a gradual step. I don't think anything or rarely something happens just overnight where you wake up and say, I'm going to do this. Boom. Sometimes it just starts. You have a dream. You have, you believe in something. And it's that belief system and that dream that kind of fuels your energy and keeps you motivated. Again, it's a process. And it gradually happened over time. And it's been four years, so to speak, since from not from the first lines I coded to, to now, but it's been four years. Mm -hmm. And that's a very good point. The fact that you cannot just take an afternoon and code something and then trade it, right? You have to go through every step. Yeah, there's a lot of trial and error. Of course, I've read some books, some uh, no, the two books from Ernest Chan. No, very well known, reputed uh, trader and uh, person. Uh, I've listened to uh, some of your podcasts as well. And by the way, uh, thank you very much, Etienne. Uh, I'm honored to be amongst your distinguished list of guests. So uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. So for the people who want to start to, let's say, create a system, like they know they want to do it, and maybe they just want to know what's the first step. So what would you say is the first step to create a system? Well, the first step to create a system, in my opinion, is to turn off the computer. And what I mean by that is you don't start a system just because you want to start a system. You have to start a system because 
first of all, you believe in something. You have to be passionate about what you're doing. You have to have an unwavering conviction that what you're doing is for a good cause. I think that's the first step. Because if you don't have that foundation, you, you won't succeed, whether it's trading, whether it's anything. Because there are going to be days where your strategy doesn't work, where your computer is going to crash, where things are just going to go south on you, and you're going to want to quit, and you're going to you know, maybe have a nervous breakdown and stuff. And the only thing that's going to get you back on that computer or start coding is that passion, that fire, that flame that you have inside of you. Simple as that. CC is kind of having a vision first, right? Yes. You, you got to have a vision. You got to have a vision. It doesn't have to be completely drawn out because if you did have it drawn out, it's going to change. No, uh, nothing, nothing is a straight line. You take two steps forward, one step back. It's a process. Creating an algorithm is uh, just like a stock chart. There's ups and downs. And once you have this kind of vision, then what would be the next step to create your system? Now, it depends what skill sets you have. No, If you're a software developer, you already have a major skill set because you can put in your own time. If you have a vision and you're not a programmer, well, you have the deep pocket to pay for a program. So again, this depends on what you bring to the table. No, You can create a partnership. You can create a strategic partners. Or you can create a little group of traders that uh, wants maybe the mathematician or the quant. Another guy is the deep pocket. Someone else is maybe the marketer and business person that can maybe attract clients. So depending on your skill set, there's stuff you can do on your own. But at one point, it's a team effort. You're going to have to partner up with people that can complement your skill set in order to build a business out of it. If you want to build a business, if you just want to be a trader you know, and do proprietary trading, that's also good. Nothing wrong with that. And speaking of trading style, can you trade the same thing with the algorithmic system as, let's say, a manual trader would trade? Or is it different stuff? My, how can I say this? Um, my training, so to speak, was by doing. No, I learned by actually trading. It wasn't, I could, my roots uh, are not academic. Like, I don't, I didn't go to school to learn finance and no, don't have a master's and MBA. That was not my avenue. My avenue was more like street smart type of learning. So my algorithm is I use the principles that I learned as a trader and I applied them. I simply applied them to the algorithm. Principles like risk management, stop losses, trailing stop losses. Uh, don't let a winner turn into a loser. That's where the trailing stop losses come in. Patience. No. Sometimes the best trade is the one that we don't do. Therefore, the algorithm doesn't necessarily start trading automatically at, at 9.30 till 4 o'clock. Sometimes if the signals aren't there, sometimes the, the algorithm will not trade a specific ticker. Sometimes it'll start at 11. So basically, all the principles that I learned as a trader intellectually, I interpret them or, or translated them into the, an algorithm. Mm -hmm. So you're saying basically that first you need the vision, then you need the skill set, decide what you want to do. And then you find your strategy, right? So what would be the next step after that? Well, after the strategy, you have to backtest. Of course, you have to accumulate data. You've got to have data uh, in order to backtest your strategy. And this is where some of the books that I read come in handy. And you have to make sure that you have out-of-sample data, meaning that you don't constantly modify your algorithm in order to fit the data that you currently have. You want an algorithm to stand the test of time. And the best way to do that is, example, if you have five years of data, you build your strategy based on the first three years, and then you run your simulation on the totality of the five years of data. So your last two years of data were never used to develop the strategy, but were used later on to backtest. So, and if your results of your last two years hold on or outperform the results of your first three years, then you know your algorithm is, for, for a small sample, no, standing the test of time. Some people will do it over 10 years, depends. My algorithm is an intraday algorithm. 
So I only, I'm in cash 100% at the close, therefore limiting all overnight exposure, which is, I think, the exception. It's a low frequency algorithm. It's not high frequency. So compared to other strategies that are daily, interday, not intraday, though I have samples of 10 years worth of data or 15 years of data. And so back testing, back testing, and back. And when can you decide that your strategy is good and that your system is good? Is there like a point where you say, okay, so my thing is fine, I'm going to trade it live? Or how does that well, work? The simple answer is as soon as it's profitable, as soon as it's making money. No, you, you have to build, depending what you're looking for, if you're doing prop trading, obviously it has to be profitable after commissions. If you want to do a business side of it, well, you have to make sure that's profitable enough to get a, a you know, to cover expenses and to give back to your clients. To a certain extent, it's a, it's a volume business. No? The more assets under management you have, the less of a gross margin you need to cover expenses. But so it, it depends. The, the short answer is as soon as it's profitable, you can start trading. No? And the question is, how profitable does, does it have to be? That depends on what you want to do with it. Do you want to just do prop trading or do you want to make, turn it into a business? Mm -hmm. And then I figure that the next step is going to be to find financing, right? Because you cannot only trade your money if you want to do a business with that. Well, you could, but it's a slow process. And again, it depends how big is your nest egg, what disposable income you have, and you're willing to put. Yes, financing. You have to, this is the whole business aspect. The, you got to, you know, you, there are many ways of, of funding. You, know, you can do angel investors. Uh, you can do venture capital. I don't think going to a bank, I don't think a bank will ever loan you any money for a type of project unless you, you're willing to give up your house. But so, and there are websites that will help you uh, you know, find a VC or an angel investor groups. And you no, know, sometimes just uh, you got to go to meetups, no? Uh, meetup, uh, yeah. contacts. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no one's going to come knocking at your door, that's for sure. So if you're serious, you got to get out there and pound the pavement, as we say, no? You got to go to meetups, uh, start making contacts, be a people person, uh, try to LinkedIn, make contacts. And again, it's nothing is defined, no, you, you, but you have to have the vision and you kind of work it out as you go sometimes, but it starts with a vision and, and, and getting out there. Mm -hmm. And this is something I've seen you work a lot on, right? Because you, you, you want to get it and you have this vision yourself. So that's pretty yes. good. Yes, I kind of started taking as we, my show on the road, so to speak, about a year ago. And within that year, I must say, uh, I think I'm doing okay. I've made contacts. I've met with PCs, angel investors. I have one coming up. I've met with hedge fund, asset management firms. Some, you know, they say they're interested. And uh, actually, they all say it's interesting. But I've learned to read between the lines. And when someone says, interesting project, they're actually saying, Good luck and don't ask me for money. <laughs> so, uh, but it's okay. You know, you're polite and you say thank you very much for your time. And but in a way that kind of motivates me even more. No, you gotta find motivation where you can. And uh, when someone you no know, kind of very politely and diplomatically uh, shuts the door on you, uh, it says okay, thank you very much. You you take that, you take that, you you harness that energy, and you just work that much harder to prove them wrong. Mm -hmm. It's pretty so, good. And for someone who's having a system, let's say right now, and he wants to get outside money, so money from investor, how should he promote this kind of a system to other people? Should you talk about the return he got or like what are some things to mention? Well, some of the things, see, the thing is that you have to know your audience, your sales pitch that will attract clients, client, and by clients, I mean by people who will put assets under management are not the same people is not the same pitch as the one that you'll use to attract investors uh, that will actually put startup capital. So you, you have to know who you're talking to and adjust your pitch to please, because different people are looking for different things. Example, you know, someone, a client, someone, a high net worth individual who wants to put maybe uh, 500,000, they're interested in returns. And even then, different Customers might be looking for different things, depending if it's a, a young high net worth individual in his mid 20s or early 30s. No, obviously he's got some business success or some success. No, he's maybe a little more adventurous, 
uh, versus to someone who's maybe near retirement or at retirement and therefore looking to preserve capital and is risk adverse. You have to know who, who you're speaking to, to in order to, to adjust your key selling points. Sometimes from the investment side, if you're looking to angel investors, you want to might be partners and be with you for the long haul. And again, it depends what type of angel investors. Some of them, you don't just want someone who has money because a lot of people have money, but not everyone has money and a skill set that is a good mix for you. you, know, you want to try to build a dream team that everybody brings something to the table. But if you just bring money and nothing else, you probably don't want him as a partner. The money might be tempting to take, but you have to have a vision. You have to know what everyone brings to the table and, and, and decide what you want to do. And finally, a venture capitalist, they work a little differently. They need to have an exit strategy. Well, they have an exit strategy. Uh, the money they will invest from you did not come from them. They come from, they were written. That money comes from someone else either like a pension fund, they'll have like a $100 million fund, and they take that money, they turn it around, they invest in startups, and within seven to 10 years, they got to have a return on that investment, which they will later give back to the pension funds that invested in their $100 million fund, so to speak. So a VC does not have the same objectives as an angel investor or a high net worth individual for that matter. So you have to uh, kind of do a shop. And just like everything else, there's, there's some shopping around. I've received a couple of offers and I've refused them because they weren't what I was looking for. So it's not easy. Mm -hmm. And I guess one thing when it comes to trading is you don't want to have someone who's going to call you every day when you have a small loss, like to tell you that you're losing, right? You want to uh, have someone who's ready to accept the risk, I guess. Yes, you... That's on the client side. It depends. Yes, of course. You want someone who's comfortable, who understands the business. And when I said is you have to choose who you want to invest, uh, who you want to partner up with, yes, that's part of the vetting process, so to speak, kind of, uh, I wouldn't say interview, but you get to know the person who wants to invest and they have to be passionate about the stock market. They have to know what they're getting into. Yes. So, yes, I agree. Crucial point. Now, I want to jump a little bit into how you manage your system because you've been telling me a little bit when we met the first time that it's not something you just like put on and then go away for like a year and then just come back at the end of the year and look at it, right? You have to manage it daily, I guess. Yes, of course. So how, how does it work exactly? Do you do it every day or? Yes. Uh, like I meant, briefly mentioned earlier, it's a day trading algorithm, intraday, meaning that uh, if, you, if I start off the day with $100,000 in cash, I will end the day with $100,000 in cash plus, example, 1% of profit. So $101,000. And if by any chance the market gaps down, uh, no, there's a, a terrible geopolitical event that happened overseas or a company missed earnings or something and it's down 20%, uh, a, a specific ticker, a specific stock, you don't care. Because you had 100,000, 101,000 at the, the at the close of the previous day. The next day you start up with 101,000. And my algorithm is is market agnostic. I can be long, short. I can reverse intraday. And if if your viewers would like to visit my site, albitrading.com, a l a l b i t r a b i n g dot com, you can see that. My competitive advantage, or actually my slogan is preservation, profits, and peace of mind. So uh, capital preservation is rule number one. That's how we preserve, make money consistently, or actually beat the S&P consistently. It's because we can preserve capital by being in cash overnight. And the peace of mind, obviously, there's less stress. You can go to sleep knowing that you're sitting on cash and... Uh, if, if something were to occur overseas in Europe or anything, you know, uh, a missed earnings report or a M&A rumor or something, we don't care. So every day, every day is a fresh start. Mm -hmm. So when exactly do you put on and off your, your system exactly? Well, the algorithm launches, uh, no, it launches around 8 o'clock. I don't trade pre-market. There's no volume liquidity. There's certain prerequisites for the, selecting stocks that are part of the algorithm. They have to have at least a 10-day 
average daily volume of a million shares and it's certain uh, about a, a 2% daily price range. We need some movement in, in the stock. If the stock is flat, we're never going to make a profit. So there has to be some sort of movement. Uh, basically, I choose high beta momentum stocks. Uh, and so the algorithm launches around 8. It's in kind of standby mode. Stock market opens at 9.30. We wait a, a period of time and it accumulates data and then it decides whether to go long and short and then it just takes off automatically. There's nothing to do. Obviously, just like any piece of software that is running, you like to monitor it in case internet goes down or the, the, the stock market, there's a, there's a halt on something. So you want to be close by. That's out of uh, no prudence. But theoretically, I don't touch the keyboard at all intraday. And everything will just liquidate. If there's no stop losses or trailing stop losses that were triggered, the algorithm will just distribute all the positions before the market closes so that we can be in cash. Mm -hmm. And then how and when do you monitor the results? Because I guess you don't want to be obsessed by the results, right? But you do want to monitor them. So how does that work? Well, uh, how do we monitor them? Well, you can monitor them through your desktop, but uh, I trade on the interactive. I use the interactive uh, brokers platform uh, to place the trades. That's where I get my data feed and the accounts. My account is with interactive brokers and we have an app. So I can leave the office if I wanted to and uh, just uh, open up the app on my iPhone and uh, I can see all the trades that I execute. And actually, I do that when I'm going to a, a presentation and I'm pitching my algorithm. I'll launch it in the morning. And at one point during the presentation, I will simply you know, show my iPhone and say, look, these are the trades that have been occurring algorithmically since we've been talking. So, yeah. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. So it can be monitored uh, over the or the phone, uh, no, iPad, or from your desktop. Mm -hmm. And then do you ever kind of review the trade to improve your system? Oh, for sure, constantly. At the end of the day, part of my routine is I download the data, and then it gets stored to my simulator, and I look at the results. No, I try to, um, no, I look at patterns. I'm constantly asking myself questions. No, I think the stock market is the ultimate puzzle. To me, it's nothing more than a math puzzle. And like, just like any puzzle, there's a solution. So I'm constantly uh, looking for a better way. No, just a challenge. No, I guess that's part of my personality. I'm, uh, I wouldn't say I'm never happy. No, uh, my two children and my, my family uh, bring me lots of joy and happiness. But you no, know, professionally, I like to challenge myself. And I think the stock market is the perfect vehicle to allow me to express myself and, and to uh, see this holy grail. Mm -hmm. I love that. So we've talked about a couple of things today and I think people will have a lot of things to do, but any other advice you would have for people who want to get started in, in system trading, basically? Well, the advice, I seem to always come back to this, but you have to have passion, no? Uh, you have to have a desire to, you have to believe in something. I think that's, uh, and no, we're talking about trading, but I think this applies to everything in life. I think stock, the stock market is a metaphor for life. So uh, it's maybe you know, a very soft, you know, philosophical answer to your question, but I, I believe it because it's not going to be easy. I recently read an article, by the way, which is a very good, it's called the Founders Institute um, on their mailing list. And there was an article that, that said, entrepreneurship will crush your soul. Learn to deal with it. because. Everything is going to go wrong at one point in time. So, but what keeps you going? It's, it's your belief. It's your, it's your inner self. It's, your, it's the belief in what you're doing, your own conviction and faith and belief system. So I don't know if that's the answer you were looking for, but. <laughs> no, I love that. Yeah, I yeah. totally believe that as well. So it's cool. Makes sense. Okay. So I want people to check your website. So how can people find you exactly? Well, uh, my website is albitrading.com. A L B I T R A D I N G. Uh, why Albi? My name is Albert, and my friends, a lot of my friends call me Albi. And at the same time, it's a bit of a, a pun, like I will be trading. So I'll be trading. It's a little, a little subtle pun. Uh, so that's, yeah. So on my website, you can check me out. Uh, my e 
with my email address, albert at albitrading.com. And um, you can call in my phone and stuff. And uh, uh, if the, yeah, that's, that's how people reach me. It's pretty cool. Um, and you post all your results on your site, right? So people yes. can see how you're doing. It's cool. Yes. Yes, good point. Uh, I do have a, a page called Performance, and I have a couple of uh, performance results versus the S&P versus the buy and hold strategy. I have distribution of returns, and I have a whole slew of metrics that uh, investors or uh, angel investors uh, or asset management firms look at, including a sharp ratio, Sortino, alpha, betas, skewness, kurtosis, so, and volatility. So these are the the basic statistical metrics that when you meet with the asset management firms and you want to kind of screen or qualify your algorithm, they're going to ask for. So, um, and again, I didn't have these at the beginning, but I, I met with an as asset management firm last year and he asked me uh, you know, some questions and I went, what? What are you asking for? So, and then he explained, I got it done. So, gradually. <laughs> Cool. No, it's really complete. I love it. So what goal about you have for the future? What goal do I have? Yeah. Well, I'm currently, I have two partners, a brilliant young uh, software developer and a, uh, a colleague, a business colleague I've known for 16 years. They're, they're partners and they're helping me bring this project to market. Uh, but I'm also currently looking for Series A funding or startup capital. Therefore, I'm seeking uh, no, an angel investor or a high net worth individual who is passionate about the stock market, understands it, and is looking, has some disposable income and, and shares the dream. So that's, cool. that's what I'm currently focused on. Yes. Cool. And I guess it's good to have a business with that, but what is your main motivation for all that? First thing that came to mind as you asked me my, that question was, um, was my children. Uh, I have a young family, started a little later, uh, but uh, I, I guess I want to make this world a better place. Um, I want to, um, I've been fortunate enough to uh, travel a bit around the world. I've been to South America, I've been to Africa, Asia, uh, more specifically Nepal, and, and I've seen some of the poverty that exists out there, and we're really lucky here. So you come back humbled from those trips. No, one of my motivation, it's not on my website. I kind of keep this to myself and, and I guess I'm just opening up right now. Um, eventually with the proceeds, I want to create a, a children's, uh, char a charitable children's foundation to help young needy kids here in Montreal and, and maybe expand to Quebec and who knows what this takes. Uh, so that, uh, they can, no, uh, dream the dream. Uh, when you're young, you're a kid, if you're too busy, you know, focusing on when your next meal is going to come from, or you know, am I going to have clean clothes today to go to school? You, you can't dream the dream. You, know, you can't, your dreams are, are stuck in your reality. And I think uh, if, if, uh, if in a way I can help, help these needy kids, uh, either to you know the basic basic needs of life or to uh, summer camps that can you know, open their horizon to sports or musical instruments or whatever, uh, they'll, they'll start believing that they, they too can achieve other things in life. That's my answer. I don't know. It just, it just came to me. And, uh, yes. That's pretty, cool. That's pretty cool. So I just, I just want to remind the listeners that all the shows are going to be on this article.com. So if people want 